Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I am Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran, and today we are going to be breaking down Russia's combat losses in Ukraine and just what these numbers mean. Let's get into it. Intelligence believes Russia has lost one third of the ground forces it used to invade Ukraine. The latest report from the Ministry of Defense claims Moscow's offensive has lost momentum and fallen behind schedule. This okay, so let's talk for a second about what he means by one third of the forces that were used to invade Ukraine. So that may, on the surface, right, at first glance, sound like not that big a deal. But what I want you guys to understand is that especially when a military is operating outside of its own territory, it requires a massive logistical tail. What do I mean by that? Well, for every one soldier who is manning a tank, carrying a rifle, putting rounds down range into the enemy, there needs to be a tail. And that is the soldiers who are tasked with moving supplies to and from the front, evacuating casualties, treating casualties, even silly things like personnel assignment, high level planning, maintaining aircraft, and uh, even forecasting and planning uh, replacement parts, shuffling around, uh, you know, different units, right? Even silly things that you may not think about as being tasks can shut down a battlefield. Like, for example, ensuring that the units that are maneuvering from place to place aren't going to clog each other, you know, having, for example, two tank battalions try to pass by each other on a narrow road. You also have the intelligence wing who's going to be responsible for target acquisition, coming up with targeting packages, communications. It's literally thousands in world war ii for every one combat soldier there were 12 other service members who were out there trying to figure out trying to solve the logistics of putting troops into combat and making sure that when they are deployed to combat they are deployed in ways that are going to maximize effectiveness they're going to be in line with the strategic guidance of the leadership now in the modern U.S. military, for example, when I was in Afghanistan, um, you had about one combat soldier had about two uh, support troops. And even the term support troops in Afghanistan would get kind of fuzzy. We, as a matter of routine, would take a communication specialist on every single patrol, right? So our communication specialists would often see more action go on more patrols than a lot of units for example artillery's uh, uh fire direction or 13 foxes and that would just be a function of necessity right we didn't have artillery we could call so there was no reason to have a, a forward observer but we sure had a phenomenal amount of communication devices so Again, using combat, non-combat troops can, in, in modern combat, can sometimes get a little fuzzy. It gets even fuzzier when we look at the United States, though, because a lot, and I mean a lot, of non-combat tasks are handled at the, by contractors. So, for example, where Russia will probably have uniformed conscripts doing all the maintenance on their tanks... In Iraq and Afghanistan, the U.S. would rely on civilian companies, usually uh, companies associated with the tank's manufacturer. So let's say your tank was built by, I don't know, uh, Oshkosh Industries. Uh, well, Oshkosh Industries would be required, per their contract, to have several thousand contractors in Afghanistan, usually in large, very secure bases, who are responsible for doing complex repairs, uh ordering parts direct from the manufacturer so it would you as you worked your way back through the logistical tail the ratio of uniform soldiers to contractors would get skewed and as a result that can make the numbers look a little goofy it can mean that more troops engage in combat operations in the u.s military and it hides the fact that while there are still probably 10 or more people in the logistical tail, it's not quite, uh, because they're civilians, it looks as though the logistical tail is smaller. So I would suspect 
that even if Russia, let's say this Russian invasion force was as efficient as the United States, and I'm here to tell you, they're not, right? They're definitely not. And again, even the United States, that two to one combatant to non-combatant ratio is, is really, if we're talking about, if we add in contractors, we're talking about probably like four or five to one. So if you lose, but here's the thing with casualties, right? Yes, some of those casualties that Russia has taken are support staff. They're, you know, a a headquarters, uh, a, a supply truck driver who's been hit by a, a Ukrainian drone. Sure, absolutely. But the vast majority of that one third of combat troops, they are going to be combat troops. So there may not be a reserve for them. Or if you are to fill out those units, your only place to reach for them is into your logistics and supply units. So you have sort of these only bad choices. You can either gut your logistics units, meaning that you'll still have frontline troops, but their ability to remain supplied is going to drop off precipitously. Or you have the option to not draw out from your combat units, but then you literally don't have people fighting. Meanwhile, your enemy is getting stronger, right? Not only are they getting stronger in terms of their ability to uh, use their weapons, their military gets better and better at fighting yours the longer they survive, but they're literally getting better and better, more high-tech weapons. And especially when you're talking about very complex weapon systems, uh, there's a there's a learning curve that your enemy has to go through especially as we've seen they the ukrainian military will be using german polish czech uh, uh british american weapons all of which they have to get familiar and proficient on so yes the first 30 days of them having say a, a patriot battery or a javelin there's going to be a learning curve of just how to work the javelin and when to employ it but that learning curve has passed for most of the small unit technology, and it's probably going to be pretty nearly passed with larger crew-served weapons like howitzers. So meanwhile, your enemy's logistics are improving steadily over time, and Russia's logistics are going to start falling off as either... Or they're either going to lose combat power or logistics power, but they don't have much of a choice. Let's see what else we can learn. Assessment is in stark contrast to briefings coming from the Kremlin, which still paint the invasion as making steady progress. President Volodymyr Zelensky warned the situation in the east of his country remains difficult. Our correspondent Joe Inwood reports now from Lviv. It's hard to believe that anyone still survives. So this is from last week um, uh, about Mariupol. Here, we'll just turn this off. So uh, the update is that, yes, most of the wounded um have surrendered it sounded like perhaps there was a small contingent of ukrainian fighters who were just n not going to surrender who were like surrender's not an option and we're gonna fight till the last but russia has reported that mariupol has uh been taken and it, it doesn't sound like ukrainian uh authorities are pushing back against that claim, which probably means that they've recognized, hey, Mar Mariupol cannot be held any longer, right? And, you know, your your thoughts and prayers are with the uh, Ukrainian soldiers in Russian custody. ...and cars, which yesterday arrived in Ukrainian territory. Our flat was destroyed by two impacts. These were either shells or bombs. Everything got burnt to the ground. Nearly a month we used to live in the basement, and then we decided to sneak to a Ukrainian-controlled area. We don't recognize the Donetsk People's Republic. Yeah, and here's the problem with the sort of Donetsk People's Republic type places, is that, unfortunately, uh, they because they consider themselves to be independent republics, they have a robust conscription program. And from what I have read, while Russian casualties are pretty jarring, the DNR and LNR casualties uh, are horrific. Uh, these are even more poorly trained troops. These are troops who have been ground down through years of warfare. So they really are scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of equipment training 
and quality of soldier. So if you're a man who is not obviously uh, uh, disabled or unable to fight, uh, yeah, getting out of the DNR is probably a good call. But it's not just civilians leaving the ruins of Mariupol. Russia appears to be drawing troops away from the siege and into the fight for the Donbass. And you only need to look at their disastrous attempt to cross the civ Yeah, if you know, I've also had a video breaking down just what went wrong in this disastrous river crossing attempt. Vetsky Donetsk River to see why they might be needed. An entire battalion wiped out over just a couple of days. It's led British military intelligence to claim Russia has now lost a third of the forces they used to launch this invasion. But in this war, you get a very different picture painted by both sides. Russia's top diplomat suggesting his country is the victim, not the aggressor. This is, okay guys, uh, full disclosure, I've previewed this video, obviously, I, I preview all the Ukraine combat videos. This is just hilarious. So, so buckle up for this misinformation. We did everything to avoid a direct clash, but since the challenge was thrown, we of course accepted it. The challenge was thrown. Okay. I still, okay. I still have yet to see an actual causes, causes belly, I think is the term, which is the pretext used for war. Like Russia decided long ago, not long ago, Russia decided at least months ago that it wanted to invade Ukraine, but it's, but it usually has a pretext and, you know, maybe there was some sort of false flag. A again, it's hard because, because I have access, we have access, right? My viewers have access to the larger international media. Um, we, and, and we generally like give it credibility. Um, because we have that, we get to triangulate different positions. We can infer which we can sort of we try to tease out the truth right by consuming news from a number of sources. Imagine, of course, if you tuned in BBC and it said Ukraine is losing, and then you turned on, uh, say, the U.S. ABC News, the Washington Post, and they're like Ukraine is winning. Right then, we would really struggle to understand what's happening in the war. We'd probably believe something in the middle, which is that it's a narrow stalemate. But the fact that literally every news source that I can find in the entire uh, world, except for Russia, it reports Russian uh, losses and defeats in Ukraine tells us that this is probably BS. But that's a function of the fact that we have access to a lot of different sources of information in countries like China or Russia, where uh, global news sources are generally suppressed a bit, um, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. You're, it's hard to know what the average Russian citizen believes. Something else that I think is I think is worth noting is that sometimes there's a lot of interviews in the street where people ask Russians, well, do you support what the government's doing? And a lot of people respond with overwhelming, overwhelmingly in favor. And it's important to note that this is a throwback to the Soviet days. If you're being recorded or you're speaking in public, you need to say that the government is absolutely right and has our best interests at heart with a high level of enthusiasm. No, no, no sarcasm there. Right. And we've seen what happens to people who sometimes even just are at a protest. Right. Nobody wants to get drug off to the gulag or forcibly conscripted. So that's why you see a lot of Russians publicly coming out in favor of this conflict. It's what they actually believe would not be clear. Um, but what they say in public has to be pro-government just for their own survival. We are no strangers to sanctions. They were almost always there in one form or another. What is surprising is the absolutely cavernous Russophobic surge that has occurred in all so-called civilized countries. Yeah, this is one of the things that's sort of annoying and it annoys me, I'm sure it annoys you guys, is whenever someone, usually it's a celebrity, gets caught with their hand in the cookie jar doing something messed up or disgusting, or in this case, an entire country, their ability to uh, claim that it is a function of gender, ethnic, 
uh, religious discrimination drives me absolutely bananas. It's one of the things that I think is the most disgusting uh, because obviously these things really exist in the world and to co-opt them to excuse your own misbehavior, especially when you're someone who is so wealthy or well-connected, or in the case of Russia, just a big economy, uh, is just just morally inexcusable, right? To co-opt the language of people who are who are actually like a, you know oppressed, and then to be like, I'm just like these guys, and it's like, the fuck you are, buddy. But that is not how this war is being seen across Europe. Finnish troops have been on exercise as their country prepares to formally request NATO membership. The very thing President Putin has always sought to prevent is happening as a direct consequence of his war. Joe Inwood. Yeah, I mean, one thing we will say, uh, while not a member of NATO, the Finnish Defense Forces, boy, have they co trained extensively with U.S. forces. They are excellent truly top notch and um it's also hard because the biggest deterrent for a lot of the nato membership was russia was russia's powerful military well as we've just discussed it's not clear that russia could launch an attack on finland if it wanted to it's not clear at all so the idea that russia uh, that russia's military which while a paper, it, while it may have been a paper tiger, it was a realistic enough paper tiger that it actually kept its enemies in check. Only when you've tried to actually have the paper tiger go into the pen and fight a real tiger, uh, or in this case, even just a very large cat, we've all realized that, oh my god, this tiger isn't actually... This tiger is just a piece of paper. It's been folded creatively. And so, once you realize that, and... If there was ever any danger posed by the tiger, a third of its combat power has been diminished. It probably couldn't fight you if it wanted to. So that is the number one reason that things have sort of turned against Russia. Remember, the it's a carrot and a stick. There's a tremendous carrot for NATO membership. That's the Article 5, which means that literally when you sign on as NATO, an attack on Helsinki will be treated like an attack on New York. And America is, it has a lot of flaws, but damn, we will not abide an attack on New York. So that's a really powerful plus for being a NATO member. Plus you get a bunch of uh, improvements to your own military by sharing uh, the latest technology and training. And you, know, you could literally have like Finnish defense force members attending u.s uh professional schools right we, we literally we will see potentially um like finnish forces attending the command and staff college or national defense university or even just their officers going through u.s basic training or um not basic training uh bullock or our, sorry our officer training so that is a benefit but the real one is that article five and the sticks, though, of not being a NATO member, uh, the deterrent is is Russia. And Russia has never been more powerless on an international level. So the only thing stopping them was that. So there we go. All right, guys, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks uh, so much, as always, to the patrons of Patreon. If you guys want to check out a uh, some videos that are just a little too edgy, for me to put on YouTube, Patreon is the place. Thanks so much to our Lieutenant Tier members. I'll see you in the next one.